Tanzania years ago, there was a uh, game park that said, look, we can only house 24 elephants. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to kill off three of the oldest males. It's always the old males. Yeah. And they did. What happened next was unprecedented. Three of the young bulls went into what's known as must. Does anyone know what must is? How about adolescence? Anyone know what that is? <laughs> All right, it's a little bit. It's a little bit like that. But let me explain to you what happened. They killed off these three older males. What happened with these young males is they started doing something no one had ever seen before in history. They began attacking rhinos. Elephants attacking rhinos. No one ever seen this before. So the knee-jerk reaction was, well, what do we do with those guys? Well, they must be crazy. Let's kill them. And we killed the world's largest ever known. Well, anyway, someone came up with the idea, well, what if, what do you do? What would you guys do? You got a teenager, he's got the car keys, he's made 20 bad decisions, it's still two hours before midnight. What are you going to do? It always gets quiet because nobody knows. I'm asking because my kids aren't that old yet. But anyway, my point is that somebody figured out, well, they said, well, we're going to kill those guys. They must be crazy. But someone came up with the idea, well, what if we introduce another old male? So they got one from Mozambique, and off the truck steps the big tusker. He walks out, and in 24 hours, all three of these guys that were attacking rhinos went out of musk. My point of this story is, if we are to manage these guys, that's the kind of complexity we're talking about. We're talking about managing the smartest species we've ever tried, the most intelligent, the most creative, the most uh, able to communicate that we've ever tried. And they live on the land. Oh, do I forget that? That makes it more difficult. Um, so these are the challenges ahead of us. Um, uh, we were talking about, um, there was a guy named Lawrence Anthony that uh, wrote a book called uh, The Elephant Whispers. And um, this guy, when he passed away, he worked with a sort of a rogue herd for a while. And when he passed away in Africa, elephants came from, some people say, over 40 miles away and stood in his yard. And at first, it seemed like this was really something that someone made up. And people say, well, why did they do that? How would they ever know? And this really does dovetail with what we were talking about. Um, I would tell you that the way this was transmitted was seismically through the earth. Uh, in other words, the long distance call we're talking about. I believe it was probably transmitted between a few herds and they all did come back to so-called pay their respects. Um, to, give you, to give you another idea along those same lines, a lot of you remember the uh, tsunami in Thailand years ago. Uh, there were 250,000 humans killed. Zero elephants. Even if they were tethered at the time, they broke from their chains, headed to high ground. People say, well, how did they know? As a species, we were still on the beach playing beach volleyball. Uh, these guys knew, I would say seismically knew it was coming, no doubt about it. But, um, you know, we try to cover a lot here, and um, um, we're happy to answer questions, but I do feel a need to tell you that we've had 6,000 school kids through here since October. We've had over 16,000 people just like you, and um, I really think it's important to understand that, you know, what's going on here, what you do today, You've already participated in conservation. You know, some of your donation actually goes to the World Land Trust where we're buying up land, trying to basically lead the um, so elephants have natural migration corridors between herds so they can mix genetic material that's not happening today. Um, there are other reasons to believe this will all happen. Um, there's also a sperm bank in Birmingham, Alabama right now. The African elephant, isn't that funny? Um, these guys, when we talk about, um, you know, all the big tuskers, guys with the big tusks, we believe we reached a genetic bottleneck with these guys already, meaning that whatever gene makes that tusk is not available. Well, here's the funny thing, that that gene, quite honestly, could be sitting in Birmingham, Alabama in a Petri dish. So when we run out of the big tusker, we might go to Birmingham, Alabama to find this. Um, but all these things are happening, and it is all possible. I mean, I, I would really encourage you to look up a few things uh, on your own. Look up the Swazi 11 when you get home. Fascinating story about the elephant's plight throughout the world. And it resulted in a lawsuit, and what happened with the Swazi 11, it, Swaziland said, hey, we got 11 of these guys we have to kill off, just like my previous story. And every hand in North America's zoo went up, and at the time, it was illegal to import them. This resulted in a giant lawsuit where a lot of uh, environmental groups were saying, hey, look, you know, they're better off dead than in captivity. Well, anyway, this resulted in a tremendous lawsuit, and ultimately, all 11 of them came to North America. 
They, they went to the San Diego Zoo, they went to Florida, they went one in Massachusetts, they've gone all around. But here's the great thing about this story. Well, Swazi 11 have now been reproducing. So, I mean, it's a glimmer of hope and it's also a great story and shows you that, hey, we're not as bad as perhaps you think we are. But um, there's all reason to believe we can make this happen. I guarantee you we will. Well said. Let's give him a little hand. Let's...